episode 27 of the Normless Podcast. My name is Mitch McPherson. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Mitch. Um, you know, again, just like all the other guests, I've had a pleasure to, to have you on. Now, I understand, um, just like Michael Gallus from an earlier episode I had on the podcast, you're a big Carlton, Carlton Blues fan. Yeah. Um, must have been a tough pill to swallow this year, going down to the Brisbane Lions in that preliminary final, mate. It was a uh, it was a tough pill, but it was I don't know. It's almost like a lot of people ask me that, and I'm pretty vocal about um, you know on social media and just in general about how passionate I am about the Blues. And a lot of people got around me afterwards, you know, oh, you're all good. And I kind of I'd almost basically grieved it from half time because I just knew it was all over. So it was better than a lot of our other games where they go down to the wire. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it was good because in in my when I actually tell my story as a mental health advocate, I always talk about growing up wanting to play. And I always used to say for about eight or nine years, I wanted to play AFL just because Carlton were absolutely shit house. But then this year they were all right. And so it was the first year of my speaking where I actually said I wanted to grow up and play for Carlton. And so it uh, it was a bit of an icebreaker. The audience quite liked that. So, yeah. Anyway, we'll see what happens next year. Yeah. And I understand you're a bit of a cricketer too in your in your heyday. Yeah. I, um, I, I played when I was young. And then um, my father-in-law, he's 50-odd and uh, he loves it. He just keeps playing sport. And so the last few years I've played with him um, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Um yeah, I probably was, and this is by no means at all me saying that I'm a good cricketer, but I definitely, you know, we were playing fourth, fifth or sixth grade and, um, you know, I was kind of getting a few runs and taking a few wickets and started copping a fair bit that I should have uh, should have moved up a grade or two. But um, I was there purely to have fun with my father-in-law and we did that. But yeah, I'm not playing this year just because there's a fair bit going on and um, I'm pretty susceptible to getting injuries and I just don't really want one of those at the moment. So yeah, maybe next year. You got a bad back, don't you? You had a, a surgery when you were younger, which yeah, agree from time to time. How's that? How's that? How, is that you know playing up, or you you're managing that well these days? It's funny. Um, you know, your back is something that you know. It's funny. I'm in the mental health space now, and um, I don't think there's anything greater in my life. You know, obviously aside from what I went through um with my loss years ago, but that can get me down more than my back. You know, I often really empathise with people that have back problems, like the the sciatic issues that people can get from that and the the nerve pain and stuff is so uh, debilitating and it's a really challenging thing. And I've had, you know, I've had a lot of friends, even a couple of friends in the last couple of months just have surgery on their backs and you just know that it just impacts you so greatly in your mental health, um, uh, with your mental health. So yeah, no, look, I'm managing mine. Yeah, I had surgery 12 years ago. I just got to watch it, but I reckon I'll be in under the knife again one day. But um, until then, I'll keep, keep moving around as much as I can. <laughs> Yeah, and so we've got you on today because you you got a story to tell, and it's a really emotive one. And you've made a hell of a lot of change in Tasmania, which led to you winning the 2017 Young Australian of the Year award. Now, take us back to the earliest time you can remember in your life, growing up with your brother Ty and your family. Um, what was your upbringing like as a child there, Mitch? Yeah, that's actually a really good question because I don't talk about that a lot um, when I, I sort of share my story. But I think my memories of, of growing up were pretty good. Um, you know, we I wouldn't say that mum and dad had a, a lot of money. I remember my um, when it came to going to a private or boys school, which is a school that dad went to, it was, wasn't necessarily about where was he going to go. I know that mum and dad were probably more looking to, to, to not send me there because of the affordability element of it. And um, But we had a great child. I, I just remember growing up and um, you know, my sister, it was me as the eldest, my sister in the middle, and then my, my brother Ty as the youngest. And, you know, mum and dad had a lot of friends and a lot of nights around at people's places, you know, with their kids playing and staying late and being carried out of the car into bed half asleep. And, and, and I love that. It was a, a really fun time. I, I love my sport. Um, uh, I enjoyed interacting with my, my brother and sister. I remember, you know, when I sort of got to that old, it's funny when you're a, a big brother, you don't sort of realize to a certain age. And I don't know, it was probably, I probably got to about 17, 18. And when I realized that how cool is this, that I've got a, a younger brother here and you sort of go from driving each other mad and all that sort of stuff to actually, you know, respecting the relationship, if you like, and started really having fun with it and forming a really good friendship. And so, yeah. So from then on, from probably 18 to 25, you know, I was out probably talk about it soon, but you know, like partying and, living my life and working and stuff. But I remember when I was home, I, I, I really love 
having fun with my brother, you know, wrestling, backyard cricket, backyard footy, um, all that sort of stuff. Mum and dad separated when I was in about grade seven or eight. And, um, you know, I don't really feel that that impacted me too greatly. I remember they used to fight so much in the end that I was kind of relieved when dad sort of said to me that, um, you know, it's all over and I'm going to move out. It was somewhat, almost like a relief that that toxicity was going to be not in my life anymore. But um, if did it impact my my sister or in particular my brother? Maybe I, I, I'll never know and I don't know. Um, but yeah, it was a, a fond reflection when I look back as a childhood. I had plenty of opportunity and um, yeah, it was a, a nice they're nice memories when I think about it. Yeah, and we'll get we'll get into Ty, into Ty's story and the I guess the preceding events that led to you know um, stay chatty, but. Looking back on it now, and I understand you've done a lot of, you devoted a lot of the the months after Ty's passing to trying to understand more about why he actually took his own life. Is there still a lot of questions in the back of your mind as to to why he did that? And is that something that constantly plagues you on a on a daily, weekly basis? You know, thinking about the why, why did he take his life? And thinking back to, you know, was it my parents and the I guess the toxicity of the relationship, was it potentially the way I treated him in the the, da- the days and weeks leading up to that? Was he mm. school or like, is that something that affects you on a daily basis? Uh, no, the, the answer would be no. Um, look, I've certainly gone through phases early on. And then as, I mean, it's been 10 years now and, you know, I still very much live and breathe his death through me sharing my story and through the organization that we've created. But I, I certainly had days or, or times there where you could very much let that consume you. And, and I've met people that are still, you know, and there's, there's people in my family that, um, you know, um, still think about that, you know, and still wonder what if and all that stuff. And I, of course, will always wonder what if. And, um, and there were things which I'll share in a second about him. But I, I think that, you know, my grieving has sort of been, I've been able to grieve through this process of being an advocate for mental health. You know, we we turned 10 a couple of months ago and I remember writing a speech and we had a lot of people that, had been there on the journey and supported me and us throughout that. And I, and I just remember saying that, you know, this, whether I like it or not, I'm, well, I don't like that. I, I, I always get upset when I think about stay chatty and the life I've had the last 10 years and finding purpose and the travel and the meeting incredible people is amazing, but it all came out of the loss of my little brother. And that eats me up when I let it. Uh, but I choose as much as I can to, I suppose, just realize that, you know, these things, um, it happened. Um, it was devastating. It turned our world upside down and, and life will never be the same for all of us. Um, but there's nothing I can ever do to bring him back. And so, yeah, of course there's moments where I, you know, I want to get caught up in, um, thinking about that and, and, but I know that that would eat me alive and it wouldn't really do me any good at all. But look, I, when I, I've been asked that a lot, you know, did, did you know Ty was struggling and is there a reason why he took his own life? And the, the short answer is no, there's no real definitive answer as to what was going on in his life. But I suppose the, the biggest learning for me, as he said, in that next couple of months, I really went from devastation, um, you know, disbelief, um, sadness, grief, guilt, you know, all those feelings to over the next few months, sort of when people ask me that question, was he struggling? I'd always, I'd always answer it with a really firm. No, you know, like, nah, he was happy. He was fun, all these sorts of things. But I suppose, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't accept that. I just sort of thought, you know what, he had so much going for him and how the bloody hell does someone with so much going for them, happy, fun, support around them, take their own life. And, and that's sort of what led me to learning more about and reading a little bit more about mental health. You know, what do people do? How do they act? Where do they go? More often than not, not all the time, because every mental health issue and concern and the way people deal with it is different, of course. But yeah, in my instance, we did learn that, um, well, I learned and sort of shared these examples with my family that met my brother in probably the last two weeks of his life was different. He's he sort of, he stopped having dinner with us. He isolated a lot. He didn't ask for lifts home um, when he normally would. And and there were certainly changes there. And and they are certainly a big driver for me now to, to share that with others in more detail than what I'm doing right now. But for people to look out for the signs, because, you know, I was just naive. I was ignorant. I was arrogant. And yeah, I, I certainly grew up in a world where I never, ever thought that um, that mental health would hit our family or my life, but let alone suicide and, and let alone my little brother who, as I said, brought so much joy to our world. Yeah, Gussie Wallen was actually on our podcast earlier in an early yep. episode. And he's obviously, you would be aware, being in that space of the work he's doing. And um, one of his, or the talk he did recently, TED Talk um, in, in Canada, Vancouver, um, 
was looking at his go-to guy um, that took his own life. And he was part of the family man that was always there for Gus whenever he needed to have a chat. And he seemed like the bloke that had everything. I think you, you would probably really reiterate those sentiments of it's really hard to understand what someone's going through behind closed doors. And you growing up had some very, you know, similar, I guess you wouldn't say you had any form of clinical depression, but you had some very low periods um, behind closed doors when it seemed like you were the, the happy go lucky, you know, really enjoying your early years. It was actually quite a struggle. I was listening to a podcast recently. You were on that. You were talking a bit about how, your mates were kind of getting ready for their, you know, apprenticeships, going to university, studying. Um, yes, they were enjoying themselves with you, but they never really discussed with you um, what their endeavors were for the future. And it was something that you never really discussed or had time to think about or never put some thought into. Um, tell us a bit about that period in your life prior to tie passing and you know, a period where you didn't really have a lot of passion for life. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I um, I certainly had fun and, and I absolutely want to reiterate what you just said there. And you said it spot on. I certainly never had, I would never put my hand up and say that I, I felt like I was depressed or had mental health issues. But what I had was a lack of drive for life. And, um, and when I say that, I don't mean I went home and thought about taking my own life or anything like that or self-harmed or anything like that. It was more... A sort of genuine unhappiness with where I was in terms of my workspace and and the things around me, but that I suppose for me, um, you know, I feel like everyone needs a bit of perspective in their life to sort of sharpen themselves up a bit. You know, we've all got problems and we've all got things going on, um, we've all got challenges, we've all got things that sort of rattle us at times, and and that's why I sort of share my when I do my presentation, I really talk in depth about my life before I lost my little brother. Because I then lead into the fact, well, then I lost my brother and it made me realize that everything that I felt was going really shit in my life and really negative and the things that brought me down weren't actually problems at all. You know, I, um, when I look back at my life and how I saw it as myself, I saw that, that I was working in a job that I didn't really like. Um, and that brought, that was probably the main one that brought me a lot of misery. You know, I sort of, I'd, I'd go home from work, um, I'd kick my boots off and, it was just really always dreading the next day. And for me, that, that makes me sad that I was that type of person, that I was low, that I was negative, that I was flat. But I suppose the biggest thing that makes me sadder about that is the missed opportunity across that journey of that probably 18 to 25 years of age when I lost my brother of, you know, missed opportunities of checking in with others and seeing how they're going. Obviously my brother and my, we might talk about the, the moments leading up to his death, but you know, I was a, a person that just didn't have drive, didn't have direction, didn't have purpose. And they're really three important ingredients in life. They're important ingredients in life, in my view, for yourself, no doubt. Like, you know, to to wake up and have zest and have passion for life and, and a purpose is amazing. But I think the biggest reason we need to be looking out for ourselves and, and working hard towards goals and, and feeling like we're getting the most out of each day is because it's so much... I advocate every day to ask people around you how they're going. You know, like if we check, if we see someone who looks like they're flat or looks like they're a bit sad, I go and ask them how they're going or I find a way to check in and see what's going on. But that is so much harder to do if you're in a space of negativity in your own mind. You know, it is so much harder to care, to show empathy, passion for others around you if you're not really in a great space yourself. And and so that's, as, as I said, as what you were alluding to, that was my life from you know, when I left college to 25 years of age, when I lost my brother, jumping around jobs, um, finally getting an apprenticeship, I should have been happy because when I look back, you know, when Ty died and I was searching really hard for those answers as to why he passed away and what could I have done more as a big brother? You know, I felt that sense of responsibility and guilt. When I looked at my life, I realized that there was so much amazing stuff going on in it. You know, like I had a, I had a really good job, great boss and, and his wife were great. And had money, I was fit, I was healthy. I needed someone to rattle my cage, you know, and I certainly didn't want it rattled by the loss of my brother, but we all need our cage rattled every now and then to go, you know what, like you can make change to your life and find that joy and find that purpose, but um, we just need that reminder every now and then. And and so that's why I say to people in the audience that I know you'd be sitting there today thinking, oh, this is going on, that's going on. But when you really look at it, is it that bad? You know, is it really that bad? And can you make some sort of slight alterations in your life to sort of fix that, to bring a little bit more joy? Um, because the benefit of that is that you'll fix yourself. You'll bring more joy to yourself, but 
most importantly, I believe is that then that'll make you an individual that will be there for others more. And and that's generally what I think we need in life to be there more for each other um, so that we can have conversations that are potentially life-saving at times. And so you're in, you're an 86 baby, Mitch. 87. 87. Yeah. So what's that now? You're about 35, 36 years old. Yep. 36. Yeah. Ty, Ty was born around 1995. So he, at the time, was would you say around around eighteen, eighteen, seventeen, yep. eighteen. So that's a large burden for anyone to carry. But at the age of seventeen, eighteen, you're at your you know the pinnacle moments of your your schooling life. Um, a lot of pressure, no doubt, on him from the schooling realm. Um, did you see any signs leading up to you know I guess the moment he took his life in two thousand thirteen that may have I guess, indicated to yourself and your family that he was struggling or he was in a dark place at that time? So not before he passed, no. So that's the, that's the sort of learning curve for us, you know, that we, um, every, when we were grieving, you know, in the, the hours, days, weeks, months after, um, you know, we're really grateful that, you know, a lot of community and family support and friends support and all that, but every single person, I, I always remember that, every single person that came and dropped off a lasagna or visited us or stopped and had a beer with us to, to help us out. Everyone asked, you know, human beings are intriguing beasts. And everyone always said, you know, was he struggling? Did you know he was battling? You know, like Ty was always such a happy kid, smiling, laughing. He was popular. He was meant to start a building apprenticeship the next day. You know, there was so much going for him, but our answer was straight away was no, you know, he didn't leave us much on his little note, um, told us he loved us and that he was sorry, but we have really no idea as to to why or how this happened, but um, it was in that transitional phase from the grief to wanting to do more around the mental health space where I, I started to, 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 to Google and learn and read a little bit more about that mental health stuff to see what the signs were. And I, I sort of remember sitting down with dad and my stepmom probably about three or four months afterwards um, after he'd passed and sort of saying, have a look at this, you know, and showing them some, some signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety and, and a couple of examples of where we saw that in Thai. And I, and I remember we were all like, yeah, you're right. You know, like that is, that was, a, they were really pivotal moments in life that for us could have been game changers in terms of our, our asking or checking in or seeing what's going on. But again, you know, it, it wasn't ever on our radar. You know, um, we were, we were naive. We were ignorant. There wasn't stay chatty around, you know, lifeline beyond blue and all that were around, but they weren't as prevalent. It was, very stigmatized to talk about mental health. And we grew up in a family where there was a lot of banter and we, you know, Ty and I played footy and we had mates and we took the piss out of each other and we drank beers. And, you know, that's, that's my favorite audience these days to get into because, you know, we know the numbers around men and um, young boys who are struggling. That's the culture you got to have. It's got to be part of that culture where you check in and ask. So yeah, look, Ty, um, you know, he stopped having dinner with us in the last couple of weeks, caught him walking home when he'd always want to lift and, um, yeah, there were things there. And, and as I said, you know, that there were a couple of other things that I don't really ever share, but, and, and then he was also starting this building apprenticeship the next day. And, you know, I, I, my genuine belief is that there was just a bit going on in his mind and, um, he, he wanted to probably ask us what was going on. And, and there were one or two opportunities where I still think back and look and see that, but, um, he didn't. And, um, yeah, sadly he didn't and, and, and taking his life was the end result. So, yeah, it's sort of hard to look back and realize that there, there were moments. But as I said, again, I when I think about them, I choose to sort of let them be my educational examples for audiences and for people and through the work we do, as opposed to me, you know, don't get me wrong. I, I think about them and I well up and I, I would love to at times sort of let it out and lose my shit, but um, that won't do me any good because, um, you know, I have to push forward and hopefully save others from going through that same experience. So I think you were driving past, is that correct? On the way home from school. And you normally asked him if you wanted a lift and normally accepts it with open arms, jumps in, jumps in the car and keen to get home and play some. Yeah. Food. This time around, he, he turned, he turned the, the offer down. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That was, I think that one was probably four days before he passed. I, we lived uh, uh, on a place called Trammy Road and it was, it was probably a couple of K um, away from where he was. And yeah, I just, you know, that's a, a moment there where um, I, um, you know, for a millisecond, you think that that's unusual that he doesn't want to get in the car, but um, you know, you just sort of life goes on and you just sort of, you know, it's not on our radar. And, 
you know, and that's a, a thing, mate, that I'm when I share this and when I'm sharing and people listening today too, you know, I don't want people to hear me say that, that, you know, Ty stopped eating dinner with us and isolated himself in his room and didn't want lifts over the next couple, over the last couple of weeks. And I don't want people to then automatically be, you know, making beds next to their kids on the ground and sleeping next to them because they're super worried that they're going to take their life. That's not what it's about. It's just, we didn't have it on our radar at all. You know, like we, we didn't think for one second ever come into our mind that, oh, maybe he's struggling with some mental health issues. And so it's just all about having it on your radar and being on the watch for it every day, not every second day, but every single day, having your radar out to your family, friends, people that matter in your life to, to notice small changes and to jump all over them when you see them, to just ask, to just ask that question, is everything going all right? And so your girl, your girlfriend at the time, now wife, uh, Maya, I understand she's a, a Syrian, but she really came into your life at a, a pertinent moment, didn't she? A year before, before Ty took his life. Um, I understand there was, a, there was a period there where, um, you know, uh, in the aftermath where you were driving home, I think it was about four months after seeing your, um, your mother and, I guess in the Hollywood kind of movie realm, you were your classical, like banging the the steering wheel, like screaming at the, in the car. But this is really a, a, a transitional moment, wasn't it? Between when he took his life and then when you, I guess, was like, were like, I need to take action on this and actually mm. do something to promote some good. And I guess rewrite the, the history books and, and build a bit of purpose out of what had happened. Hundred percent, yeah. It was, um, you know, we. I, I suppose the 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 building of Say Chatty and the idea. It sort of, it was probably a couple of months after Ty, and just sort of, you know, um, it's just an ordinary time. You know, anyone listening to this and and people on um that have been through a suicide or you know, deep caring for someone with deep mental health issues. You know, you know that it's, it just is. I can't imagine that there's a lot worse in life. Um. And, uh, you know, we were right in the middle of the grief and the, the sadness and everyone was upset. And, you know, it was just sort of, how do you ever move on? You know, how do you ever live your life without him around? And and you have those days where you just, you know, it, it gets too much and people breaking down and you're trying to check in on each other and do your best you can, but you yourself are a mess and all those sorts of things. And yeah, I remember um, I'd been thinking about it, you know, like, what is it that we can do? You know, I'd I'd, I'd never accepted that I'd, that Ty wasn't coming back, but in a roundabout way, he sort of had to. It was like, well, he's not coming back. What have we sort of learned here? You know, this is a, and, and I suppose for me when thinking that I was like, well, I've learned that I could have probably done more and I could have reached out to him a lot more and I could have noticed that he wasn't right. And, and that was eating me up, but I thought, what, what, how can I put that into something positive? And yeah, I, I'd, I'd visited mom and um, we'd been out for a while and yeah, she was a real mess. And um uh, I'd sort of left her in a really bad state at her place. She lived about eight minutes from where we lived and I was driving home. And yeah, as you said, it was like a movie where you, you know, you're hitting the car and you're screaming and angry and just letting it out. You know, you just got to let it out sometimes. And, um, and that was sort of the day where I got home and um, yeah, grabbed a, a pad and pen and, and just came up with the idea of a car sticker and this silly little logo that um, <clears throat> I knew would, <clears throat> the silly little logo that I knew would, pay tribute to my little brother, but um, most importantly, I suppose it would, it would start raising some awareness because I were, I suppose in that moment I created the sticker, which paid tribute to my little brother, but in life, I sort of made a, a deal with myself that, you know, I'm going to be vulnerable with strangers and everyone. And I'm going to really share this to the hills as to what's been going on and what we've learned, how I feel. And I think on the same night, set up a Facebook page and yeah, just, um, basically started blogging um, about life, you know, how, how shit it was to not have a brother around. But at the end of it, they were, they was always filled with positive messages about, you know, make sure you check in on your loved ones and your family and your friends. And, and I, I just sort of really started to resonate with a lot of people here in Tassie, you know, people reaching out saying, I'm so sorry for your loss, but um, because of your vulnerability and your sharing and your moments in time, you know, we're now having chats around the dinner table and looking out for our kids a lot more and, and we're thanking me for it. And, you know, there's, you know, that was a really rewarding thing in life, you know, because I'd, you know, I'd worked and I'd worked hard and I'd played sport and had a lot of mates and stuff, but I'd never really stood for anything in life. You know, I'd do, I was a glazier, but I probably wasn't the greatest glazier going around, you know, like I'd, um, good to roll some putty up the side of a window. But other than that, there was a lot of other things around the glazing aspect that I wasn't great at. And so it was really nice to be, 
you know, re- re- being told that I was standing for something and that I was making a difference. And that was really addictive for me. You know, I, um, it, it became addictive, but also as well, as I said a moment ago, it was a, a way for me to grieve him, um, to hopefully make him proud and, and to, to carry him with me with all the work that I do. But, um, the sticker really quickly is, um, speak up, say chatty. It's a little pair of shorts, tie, love wearing footy shorts. He'd wear them wherever he could. Um, and it obviously incorporates his name, Ty, in the chatty, which is um, capitalised. And um, the real reason behind shorts is Ty always wore footy shorts, but he'd always wear them without any undies everywhere. So there are a lot of uh, awkward moments where we, you know, tell him to put his feet down off the coffee table or things like that. So yeah, it was um, Tig was a Tig was his nickname. He was a pretty well known young fella, and his suicide certainly spread far and wide across the community. And so therefore, there was an already a really big audience there to be captivated by the opportunity to break down some barriers and to do something in his legacy. And um, yeah, it was sort of something very different here in Tasmania, particularly in the South. Um, It sort of hadn't really been done before in terms of a 25 year old male who played footy, um, you know, breaking down stigma and being vulnerable. And I suppose that was the biggest thing that connected with the the Tasmanian community for them to stand up and take notice and support it. Yeah. It's it's been incredible the way you've been able to, you know, rewrite the script to some extent in terms of pulling all the positivity out of such a um, negative or, you know, tumultuous situation in your life that caused a lot of grief um, and build a lot of purpose and and drive in terms of what you actually want to do with your career. Um, take us back to the actual moment in time when, when Ty took his life in 2013, the actual night. Uh, you remember it very fondly um, and it still brings back a lot of emotion um talk us through that moment mate yeah um i I know it's funny um you know people always uh i've actually probably started getting i've done nearly a thousand of the the lived experience presentations and then other you know shorter formats of it of telling my story and and basically one of the one of the most common parts of my story is always um the day of or the night that that he passed and I don't get a lot of joy out of doing that and, um, you know, revisiting that. I, I feel the things that I felt and, and, and I always obviously re-see the things that I saw that night and whatnot. But, um, you know, I really believe in the power of lived experience and, um, and, you know, I could get up there and talk about the loss of my brother and all that stuff, but I feel that the impact of, of sharing with people about the actual, um, trauma from that night is, is powerful. Um, as I said, I don't share it to, to, for any other reason for others to sit there and go, you know what? I don't ever want that to happen to me. I don't want to feel those fe- things and, and see those things. And, and that's the main reason as to why I, I get out there and, and talk about that night. But yeah, I'd, um, I'd had a cruisy day at work. It was my first day back at work for the year. Um, I was, I was then home that night. I lived with dad in Tramere um, with my stepmom. Ty would come and stay there between there and mums. And um, it was a Monday night. I'd finished my first day back for the year. I just wanted to chill. My um, my my partner, um, Sahar, who's now my wife, um, she had um, come down to sort of spend some time with me that night. We were we were just sort of sitting there having in my room. I remember I was standing and, and she was sitting um, and we were sort of arguing about dinner and I think we we're arguing because I'm, I'm not, I tell this story a, few, a lot, but I think it was because I'd told her I'd cook and then she came down to visit me and then I was telling her to drive me up to get some Maccas for dinner. So, you know, me being me, I wasn't very good or fond of the kitchen and, but that's life, you know, like, as I said, it was, um, 25 years of age, um, qualified glazier, um, when I look back now, I didn't really have any cares in the world, but I, I know that there was a lot of misery there just purely because I just wasn't getting that drive or I didn't really stand for anything. And so therefore every night was just, you know, what are we going to do for dinner? Um, have a bit of a laugh and then, you know, get up and go again the next day. And, uh, but yeah, we're, we're chatting about dinner and all of a sudden my, my, my phone started ringing in my pocket and it was my mum. And, um, my mum used to ring me a lot back then, you know, she'd ring me two, sometimes a couple of times a day, you know, what did you do today? When he, what did you wear today? When he coming to see me, I didn't live with mum. So she was, you know, pretty invested in wanting me to be part of her life as much as I can. And I just sort of remember looking at the phone call thinking, oh, mum's, you know, just ringing me to see how my first day at work was. So I actually threw the phone on the bed and said to my girlfriend, you know, Sahar said, remind me to call her back after we have something to eat. And it was probably about 30 or 40 seconds after that. Um, we was we were just still chatting away and upstairs above us in the kitchen, dad and my stepmom were were preparing their own dinner and um yeah, out of nowhere just heard this um heard this really loud yell or sort of a a deep yell from dad and 
And then there was some banging, which I still don't really know what the banging was. But then my stepmom um, started screaming a hell of a lot louder than what dad was. And um, yeah, I, I just sort of waited like 20, 30 seconds. We we sort of just sort of froze and um, looking at each other, sort of wondering what the hell was going on. But um, I, I feel deep down, we it's funny, you know, nothing like that had ever happened in my life. You know, I'd never seen anyone have a car accident or, you know, I've seen people get injured in footy and that, but nothing really traumatic. And yeah, it's just something that you, no wonder people get PTSD from those things. You know, I still think about that moment, just that 40 seconds of all the trauma and all the dark stuff that was coming my way in the next 12 hours, that, that moment there of just looking at my partner, looking up at the roof and, um, and knowing that um, something bad was happening, but I, I suppose ultimately too afraid to get out and find out what it was, but um, yeah, after a, a, a little while, 30, 40 seconds, I, um, came out of the room, started running up the stairs and, uh, and there was dad and, um, you know, dad's a, a big burly shaved head bloke that, um, had rarely ever showed any emotion. And, um, I'll certainly never, ever forget him sort of screaming at me and, uh, yeah, yelling that mom had called him. Um, and I'm still glad I didn't answer the call, um, telling us that we needed to get to her place. She lived about seven minutes away and that, um, her and her husband had uh, had found Ty in his bedroom where um, he'd suicided and uh, and he'd taken his own life. And um, it's funny, I, I still remember dad saying, we're going, and um, and he took off. Uh, I went back downstairs, sort of, I think Sahar heard, came upstairs, and I'm a real, like, people will laugh at this, but I'm like a real, I'm real particular. Like, I'm organized, I'm big on safety. I Dad left, and dad yelled it at me, I think, but then I still went around and checked all the doors were locked at the house. <clears throat> Sounds so strange, but like, I'm just like, I was like, my mind was like, what the, what the fuck is going on? But okay. I was like, I've got to check the back door. I've got to check the front door. And then, yeah, we, we jumped in the car and, um, oh, I don't talk about this bit much, but, um, yeah, we jumped in the car. Um, I remember, you know, telling her, you know, she was driving. I'm like, hurry up, hurry up. She's like, I can't, you know, it's a 50 zone along Tramby road. And, yeah, just I just remember thinking that like, oh, this you know it can't be true, you know, like it, that it cannot be right. Like, there's got to be a mistake. Like something's, mum's got it wrong, or you know, this can't be. It can't be. You know, just sort of rocking back and forth in the car. But um, I think the reality of it and the enormity of of that it's actually going down was we sort of turned into mum street, and it's sort of like she's right at the end of the cul-de-sac, and um, it's like a probably two hundred meter street, and then her house is right dead straight at the cul-de-sac, and all I saw was, I think, like three ambulances and, um, you know, parked up on the lawn and a police car, and like the so like the flashing and all that going. And um, that was sort of the reality that, you know, this is here. And she yeah, had talk about like a movie again. I, 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 she said she'll go and park. There was cars everywhere. I jumped out of the car and like ran that 300 meters. And um, yeah, again, I, as I said, I don't say this for any other reason that it was just um, truly heartbreaking, you know, getting halfway, falling over um screaming you know having a girl come like pick me up and she sort of knew what was going on and like dragged me up there and yeah just getting there seeing dad out the front and yeah it was just an awful night mate and um yeah the it's sort of a blur after that I didn't go in the house um you know I had sort of mum and dad relaying messages to me from the porch you know like mum telling me dad was still in there with him with the paramedics and um, and then dad sort of coming out and you can see in his face that we'd lost him and, you know, then police come and, uh, friends rock up and you sit around outside. I was, I had a really bad, yeah. Talk about bad back. I remember my back was a really st stage where my back was really bad and I had no shoes on and just a t-shirt and it was kind of cooling down. I remember my back aching and it was just, yeah, it was, uh, a terrible night. And, um, the, it, it we entered a world of, of suicide that night and, um, our lives were completely scarred and, and will never, ever be the same after that moment. It was awful. Yeah. Well, um, you know, you got my eyes watering here, mate. I don't <laughs> find that often, but, uh, yeah, just you, you can hear the, you can hear the, um, you know, the emotion in your, in your story, the way you relive each kind of step, you know, from when you got the call through to the journey to the, to your mum's house and through to going up the, you know, up the hill towards where the ambulance and the police cars were. And then that nice moment, um, you know, it's, I think it's a, you know, say it sounds very like cinematic, like a movie, but in reality, I think it, you know, the, the response that you got from it with, 
you know, setting up the Facebook group and developing what's been over now, like 70,000 stickers. I don't know if that number's changed. since. I think it's probably up. I think it's up to over 90 now. Yeah. We need to update yeah, our wow. website. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like to think that you had such a, an immense impact. Um, but that night, you know, you, I don't know. I don't know how you would have got to sleep. Even for those two hours you went to bed, but you said you got to bed around 3 a.m. in the morning. You're up on Facebook, just scrolling, looking at messages and that kind of thing. You ended up getting a couple hours sleep, but then you got up again at 5 a.m. and went for a, a walk. I imagine that was a regular occurrence for the, the following months, you know, not much sleep, if any, um, you know, consistently ruminating about what if, why, yeah. you know, wh why has this occurred? Um, tell us about, you know, the, I guess the, the, ne that, that evening and the. Following. Yeah, for, sh for sure. Yeah. So we, um, yeah, it's um, at the night is, as I said, a lot of it's a blur. I know that there were, you know, a lot of friends and family rock up as news makes way. And, um, you know, and then there's the moment where, you know, Tig, Tig gets taken away and, um, and all that sort of stuff. And it, it's just a real moment. Like, well, what the f you know, like, what do you do now? You know, I just remember sort of looking around, he's driving off in the back of a, a, a vehicle down the street and, you know, like what, what do you do? You know, it's 12, you know, 11 PM, 1130 at night on a bloody Monday night. And all of a sudden you've just, a family member has just uh, killed themselves, you know, like what the, you know, like, what do you do? And, um, yeah, I remember went back down to dad's and um, I think my grandma came and stayed and we just sort of went there and yeah, you sit around, you have a lot of silence and eventually, you know, try and go to bed for a bit and um, yeah, having a look, my phone was buzzing a lot. And so you sort of look at that and, but it's all, you know, the, the messages and people writing on your Facebook wall and stuff as, as word gets out, you know, you read it, but it's not, you know, nothing was sinking in that it was a reality. You know, it was, a, you know, you hear that a lot that it's a bad dream and, you know, I probably remember thinking oh, I'll go to sleep and wake up and it'll be gone. And yeah, but no, you wake up and I, I went upstairs and it was about 5am and dad's just sitting there having a cup of tea and his, his mom and his um, wife, my stepmom just sort of sitting around, just not saying anything. I said, I'm going for a walk. And I remember walking along Tramie road and I, I had my hoodie right over and you know, my, as I said, my back was fucking killing me. I couldn't believe that of all times to be in such a awful moment of life and then to have my back and my sciatica aching so much. I just couldn't honestly believe that my luck, but I remember walking and it was helping and um, yeah, my hoodie pulled over and I actually walked past someone and um, I don't know who it was or where she was, but I just, you know, the hoodie pulled right down because I had tears flowing everywhere and cars driving past and stuff as they start to go to work and yeah, just that week is a blur. I, I remember always thinking that the funeral, which we ended up booking in on the Friday, would be, it was like I sort of, you know, felt that once we buried him, I would be okay. That was just something that I always used to think that, right, we'll bury him. It'll be a, a great send off and then it'll be okay. But it turns out that that's, that's absolutely the opposite. You know, like you have so much support and people around you and, and stories, people sharing stories and, and grieving with you together. But the reality is that everyone goes back to their normal life. They, they love Ty and they missed him, but it wasn't their brother or their son or, um, you know, their cousin. So, you know, people go back, your friends go back to normal life and that's just the reality of the world. But in that moment is where it hits even harder. And yeah, those next few weeks and months are, are really difficult. You know, I decided to go back to work after a week and, you know, you just got to keep busy and, and keep moving as much as you can. But yeah, I tell you what, there's a, a lot of tears and a, a lot of dark moments and, um, and a lot of disbelief, a lot of anger, um, a lot of sadness. Um, but as I said earlier, you know, for me, it's sort of, it all sort of just over time, over a, a few, a few months has sort of started to transition from the, I want to do something because this is not right. Um, and yeah, it turns out doing something has, has certainly made a difference for others, which is something that I'm really proud of. Yeah. It seems like a bit of a commonality among a lot of guests that I've had on the podcast. We've had, um, Andrew Hamilton and Kate Austin recently, and, and, and it's a commonality in that when, when they're faced with life hardships and, and tough life circumstances, is, do you think it's a little bit of a, a reaction or a, a way of dealing with the previous circumstances you've had that you've been able to channel this into something so positive and and if we look at the stats i guess there's around 60,000 non-for-profits in australia and we spoke about this with kate austin how saturated the space is and i, I imagine a lot of that would be in the in the mental health realm as well um 
what do you put down to, you know, I guess stay chatty and relationships Australia, you know, working in, in close sync there. How's that been in terms of the effect it's had on Tasmanians? I think it's the first time that they've ever had some form of organization organization that has encouraged people to come out and speak about their, their issues and their burdens. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, well, I, as I said earlier, I think that the, um, you know, there's, there's been mental health charities and advocates and stuff and, um, and I'm certainly not sitting here on a bot on a soapbox saying, you know, I absolutely changed the way um, people view mental health here in Tasmania, but I don't know. I was just, um, I suppose my vulnerability through connection and, and my willingness to be open about what I'd been through, as I said, a 25 year old trade, he was very, un, was sort of very unique. Um, you know, there'd been people that have advocated before and your big organizations, but I think a homegrown, um, devastating story was something that everyone sort of connected to and started to really stand up and take note of. And, um, not only for people, you know, I think that when I think about setting it up and the advocacy work and the social media and whatnot, it was great that people were reaching out saying, Oh, I don't want this to happen to me. So now we're, you know, having uh, meetings around the dinner table and checking in on our kids a lot more. But I think one of the most, the most beautiful things for me was in setting all of that up was that I had so many people reach out that, um, had lost someone to suicide in the past and they were telling me that they were really proud of of what I'd done because they too wished that they'd had the strength or the opportunity to do that as well. And I think that that was a, a really amazing moment for me and probably one of the biggest reasons I was like, you know what, I got to keep going with this. I got to got to keep making a difference and doing it because it was, it was um, empowering and I suppose encouraging people that had been through suicide to see that there was actually something happening, um, that there was some change being made and that there were people out there willing to give it a go and stand up and break that stigma and encourage people to have more conversations. So yeah, it was, um, and look, there's, there's lots of charities and, um, and it's an interesting thing. Like we now, you know, I feel like we're a real leader in Tassie, you know, I'm starting to travel a lot more around the country and share and, um, and all those types of things. And I was very fortunate to link him with relationships Australia, Tasmania. They, um, they basically um, donated to a run that we did. And then I had meetings with their, their, their former CEO and, um, just sort of said, look, I'd love to do this as a job. You know, I, I'm, I'm starting to get more requests to speak and whatnot. And they essentially employed me, which was a, a pretty remarkable moment. They employed me for three days a week for a couple of months. I got super busy and then went full time and um, I've been full time 10 years next August. So it's been, you know, that opportunity to gain employment with them and, and partner the organization with them is um, has been a wonderful opportunity. So many people message me and ask me for advice and tips around setting up a not-for-profit and, you know, how to gain legs and traction. And I always say, find your RA, your relationship with Australia, you know, like find a business that is really well aligned with your values, your goals and what you're determined to do and, and see if they want to invest in you because that investment from relationship Australia probably put me four or five years ahead as opposed to, you know, working myself, doing it out my own backyard. Um, you know, we get HR supports, finance support, all that sort of stuff is an, as an incredible thing. But look, I think in the, in the space, the charity space, you know, if someone had said to me though, it is a, it is a saturated market. You're right. And it's very interesting that, um, uh, lots of people want to set them up, particularly in the mental health space. And a lot of that to do is with people go through their own experience of loss or hardship, and then they want to share their own experiences very much exactly the same as what I did to share my story. Um, and it's interesting because if someone, I, my advice to people now is, is there an opportunity to collaborate? You know, can you collaborate with an existing organization or an existing advocate to join forces and double your, um, that's opportunity a- double your message together because if you go on your own and you drag funds away from a certain community that's funds that won't go to another one and whatnot but the, the the tough thing about that is if someone had said that to me at that time i probably would have said to bugger off because yeah. you know you want to share your story you believe in your own message and and that's a really tough one as well so yeah it's kind of like a catch-22 that you like you want to do your own thing but you also um yeah there's there's certainly greater benefit for the community and to have greater impact if we collaborate a lot more and and that's why with Stay Chatty, I love that. Like I just attended um, Lifeline Tasmania's 50th birthday the other night. You know, we have um, great relationships with all mental health organisations around the state and around the country because I believe that we're all in it together and and we all need to make a difference. So saturated market for sure, but lived experience is where it's at. You know, I really believe that the, and, and not just because I have a story, but, you know, I'll sit and listen to anyone talk about mental health. I connect 
far greater with someone who has experienced loss um, and knows exactly what it's like to be in the trenches. And I think that's why a lot of people, and I don't say that arrogantly at all, but I think that's why a lot of people um, get value out of my story and, and, and the organization that we've created. That's exactly what Kate Austin reiterated. You know, there's a lot of charities doing the same thing, but okay. together, and it's great that you've done that, you know, partnering with Relationships Australia, because I guess like we were, like that, as the saying goes, you know, two, two, two brains are better than one. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, bringing, pulling resources and knowledge and skills. And I think that's a really, really positive uh, message that you send there as well. So I guess looking at what well, we're talking about Gus Warland a little bit before and Gus, so Gus Warland in New South Wales, you know, with the gotcha for life, yeah. UGB radio, he's very much the, I guess you'd say go-to guy or the spokesperson for mental health and mental well-being. Um, you've pretty, I know you say that you, you know, you haven't been very groundbreaking with what you've done, but in Tasmania, you're very much the go-to guy when it comes to mental health and these really challenging conversations. Um, I guess, but in your job with Relationships Australia and, you know, reliving your story three or four times a week for a long period of time there, did it, did things ever get exhausting? Were you ever emotionally, because we were talking about how you came out of this and you, you, you basically rewritten the script in that you've turned a positive out of a negative, but I imagine it would be very overwhelming reliving this story and after you said a thousand plus times you've you've told this story you still get teary and really emotional um i imagine it would have been very burdensome on your own mental health as well yeah for sure uh and before i get to that gus wallen we certainly know who got you for life is i every time i go to chemist warehouse i get asked <laughs> if i want to donate so yeah. he's certainly um, a chemist warehouse a lot with two young kids so um i know exactly who he is and actually we uh, he and i gus and i actually I can't even remember. It was Suicide Prevention Australia Life Awards. He and I both won an award on the same night and had the opportunity. This was very early days. Yeah. Um, had the opportunity to um, share a few words with him in a photo. And I've certainly watched very fondly at the the work he does. Haven't connected again yet, but um, I would certainly love to one day. But yeah, look, it's um, I when you start anything, your head down, bum up, working your ass off. You know, you would know that. And and that was me. And you know, stay chatty was um going really well. It was, um, it was growing legs. It was getting people supporting it, wanting to be around it. It was really making a difference. And, um, I was certain, you know, as you said, doing four or five talks a week, traveling around the place all the time and, and working really hard, but, but being reminded that I, you know, was preaching self-care and people to have balance and, and look out for themselves where I wasn't doing that myself, you know, in the first probably three or four or five years, um, but basically my answer to anyone telling me to slow down was to get lost and, you know, piss <laughs> off and, you know, I know what I'm doing. I'm in control. Yeah. Get out of it. But, um, but I did have, I did have a bit of a, a, a not necessarily a breakdown, but I lose my way a little bit. Um, I can't even remember when it was, it was some years ago, just sort of the emotion. It just really got me. Like I just, I just remember doing one talk and, and just falling into a well. And, and I suppose I, I when I look back into that time, I was, going experiencing a lot of signs of you know um and i'm not saying i had it but so, a lot of those signs and symptoms of you know depression anxiety that can come into your life and and not leave and and they didn't leave for a bit longer than what i probably would have liked and and that was a really big reminder for me that you know it's time to do things differently and um and to not slow down but just have a bit more um balance and you know prioritize what you need to do you know is it necessary for you to go to all those four or five meetings when you've got a team and, you know, share the load a little bit. And um, that's been testament to my longevity and what I do is having a team around us, um, you know, particularly Tash, who's our um, senior project officer who, you know, organizes our ball and short stay, which is an initiative we have. She comes to us with a, a lived experience losing her dad um, five years ago, four or five years ago. And, um, you know, for, for people to be around me, to support me and to remind me of the importance of looking out for yourself and to go home after, a, you know, go home earlier if you've had a big talk or, you know, have that balance. It's just been wonderful. And um, yeah, there's no way if I'd remained at that pace in that first three, four, five years that I would be doing it, I would have been burnt out and I would, you know, I'd hate the sound of my own voice and I wouldn't be able to stand and deliver what I do. So um, it's really important for anyone, you, you know, you have a passion, but you, you do have to listen to those around you that are telling you to slow down and look out for yourself because 
whether you like it or not, the finish line will come a lot sooner if you don't. Um, and I'm certainly glad that I listened and, and took on board that um, that advice from those around me. Yeah, was it just you were just keen to 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 build, stay chatty, or was it? Do you think it came out of like maybe a bit of bitterness and anger anger at the world that they'd taken Ty and that this was kind of what you were, you know, doing with your life? And that I know you say you found a lot of fulfillment and passion, but were you kind of, um, yeah, a little bit bitter towards what had happened and maybe people kind of telling you you couldn't do it, and maybe you were just doing it for Ty to really like. I guess champion his life as, yeah. a, as a, something that brought about a lot of change. It'd be a mix of it'd be a mix of all that I reckon. And look, I um I see people journal these days, and I don't journal. I you know I've got a pile of journals and books out there. I don't read as much as I should, and I should journal. But I I wish to God I did because those um those tough times and those moments in this journey would be so enriching to go back and have a read on what where I was at and what I thought and what I felt. I I really wish that I could have gathered all that with me and brought with me so that I could have in moments of reflection, look back and see where I was at and what I was doing. But yeah, definitely, you know, the mix of, um, there's no doubt that a huge element of me doing what I do is um, the the wishing I knew more before Ty died. You know, that, 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 that eats me. And as I said, I could, I could absolutely curl up and give this away and let that eat me until, you know, times get too much um, in terms of wishing I could have done more to support him and realize that he was struggling um, there were certainly people that didn't want to know about me. There were people that, you know, I know were saying things, big organizations that, you know, who's this 25 year old tradie out there talking about suicide. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's going to do more harm than good, all that sort of stuff. And yet, and there'd be an element of me arrogance as well, you know, like bullshit, you know, like I, but I, I suppose when I say that the arrogance of me saying bullshit, I've got something to offer. The reason being is that I truly believe and believe that if I had shared my own story to me um, 10, 11, 12 years ago. I would have walked away from that story and gone, you know what? I've got a little brother. I've got a sister. I've got family. Mental health is rife. One in five experience a mental health issue in any given year. Over 3,000 people suicide every year. Um, you know, so many people get depression, anxiety, and don't get treatment for it because they're worried about the stigma. I would have realized that and walked out of the room and gone, you know what, I'm going to do something about it. And I think that was probably the biggest one for me going, well, no one did this for me. Every audience that I stand in front of and I share and every post I write on social media, I don't really know who's seeing it or who's taking it on or who's going to make change with it. But I had faith that it was. And, you know, it turns out it was that a lot of people were reaping benefit from it. Um, but yeah, I suppose there was just a lot, you had to have a lot of faith that it was making a difference and, and wishing that I could have done the same for myself. Potentially, maybe, do you think you ever think about tall poppy syndrome and maybe people thinking, oh, he's, he's feeding off his, you know, brother taking his life and trying to make a bit of a career out of it. Like, I think there's probably a lot of that in, especially yeah. in Australia too. I find it's a bit of a, a really weird thing with the way, you know, people, we spoke about this with a number of different guests, but I guess there's always those doubters and no, yeah. he's never on story, but you just kind of, you just got to shut them out really. Meaningless. You know, speed off them. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, and look, I um, I've always been conscious of that, and, and particularly now, and I'm not sure if we're going to talk about it or not. But me starting to move into um, you know, like podcasting myself yeah, and yeah, yeah. um, radio. I've got a, I'm on a radio show now, and I'm emceeing the Jack Jumpers, the NBL team here, their game day stuff. And you know, you're moving into that, and you're in the the public a little bit more. And um, you know, there's I've seen things written and stuff like that. But um, I still two things. I still get nervous. When I speak, um, you know, people get, don't believe me that I, you know, I did one the other night for RACT, 90 people at the casino and I was shitting myself. Like I am, I get nervous. And a lot of that is because I, I have imposter syndrome. You know, I don't ever believe that I should be doing what I do and the opportunities that I've, you know, met the prime minister and all these types of amazing things that this has given me, taken me to America. Like I don't ever, ever think that why is this happening to me? You know, but, um, uh, and there'll always be people that, you know, the naysayers, but they're on the couch. A lot of people that, you know, you, you sort of learn that people that have something rough to say or negative to say, are, you know, sitting in the comfort of their lounge room, sipping on a tea, you know, haven't really ever taken a, a challenge or a yeah. challenge on or decided to get out there and do anything different. I wish them all the best and we hope that they do <laughs> decide to get out there and have a crack. But um, look, I, in saying that too, though, mate, um, 99% of um, 
uh, any sort of commentary around me or my work or here has been positive. You know, we've been, we would never be where we are without the the community um, businesses, individuals that still fundraise for us and, and share stories on our behalf and whatnot. It's, it's been remarkable and, and something that I'm just so grateful for. It sounds so cliche, but we wouldn't be here if people didn't believe in us and, and give us that opportunity that we've had. Absolutely. And a, a lot of those people too are likely going through their own struggles as well. So whether they hmm. respect what you're doing or not, it's likely they're going to benefit from any of these organizations and institutions at some point in their life. So it's really, really important work. One of one of my greatest lessons, you know, I always use this example and, you know, it takes, you know, I'm a very different person to what I was, um, you know, before I lost Ty and setting up this charity, you know, I would, I would walk around the streets and if I saw someone, uh, homeless or walking down the street screaming and yelling my reaction all the time would have been like jesus you know like what what are they doing like what's going on there like that's strange but i i I believe now we we should all choose to you know take the other side of that now is where i say it's like well what got them there you know and what is it that's gone wrong in their life and have a bit of empathy towards it is there someone that could have supported them can we support them um and i think always remembering too that you know no matter what situation you see in life you see someone who's missing a finger or in a wheelchair or whatever, you know, that could be you tomorrow. It could be your, your, your brother, your sister, someone you love tomorrow, you know, like we must have empathy every single day and, and understand that we only get one life. We get one world. Um, and it's just important to be kind all the time because you never know when you're going to be in that situation of losing someone or going through a tough time. So yeah, we, um, there's always anyone that's got something to say or, negative or, or got a view on something there's likely a reason behind that and so it's really important that we maybe before judging them abusing them or being unkind is maybe be kind and try and unearth what it is that's made them feel that way dealing with kindness eh? yeah absolutely um so share with us maybe some of the most moving or i guess memorable moments during these seminars you've run where someone's come up to you with a story to tell about maybe a family member that's attempted to commit suicide or <coughs> someone saved their own, save one of their, you know, children or family members life through just having a simple conversation. Tell it, tell us what you've found the most moving moments. Yeah, there's been a, there's been a few, one actually happened about uh, probably a month ago and I'll share that with you, but look, that's probably been the biggest thing, you know, like in, in the mental health and suicide prevention space, I, I want to save everyone. You know, I don't want to, I would love, imagine a world without suicide or a world without poor mental health, you know, and it's, and the reality is it's not going to happen. You know, like we would love that. And that is the dream goal for everyone. But um, at the end of the day, um, it is difficult to get caught up in hearing about them. You know, like we, you know, I get a lot of messages and you, people sort of turn to me and our team for support when they go through it. And so it's very it's very in our face that we hear or know about it when someone generally across the state takes their own life, not all the time, but, but a lot of the time. And um, you can get really consumed in that and, and caught up in that and let that be a real negative for you. You know, like that's really hard to comprehend and understand that we're doing all this work and working our ass off and yet people are still struggling. They're still taking their own lives. You know, I've let, I've let that eat me up a lot over the years, but I'm, you know, at the end of the day, it's important though that we, focus on the positives and the impact that we're having, because we're likely never, not never going to hear about a lot of the positive impact that we've had of people that have walked out positively impacted or shared something with us. And in fact, that was the first time that they've ever told anyone in their life about how they've been feeling. So it's important that we choose to, <clears throat> to focus on the positives and, and let those be a real beacon of support for us. And um, yeah, I had a, um, a bloke once tell me about his brother struggling and, and I gave him a copy of my book and, you know, his brother had been in some really dark places and barely come out of his room in a few months. And I gave him a book and and I heard from him about it probably about three or four weeks later. And he said, my, my brother actually read your book and um, booked himself into a GP and he's, and he's getting out there and he's starting to make some, um, some transitions into some really good places um, because he, he read your book, saw the impact of suicide. And he doesn't want us to ever feel that way. And, and um, you know, that's pretty, pretty powerful, pretty moving. And there's been, uh, as I said, never, ever floating our own boat, but there've been a lot of those. And that's what allows you to get up and go and do it. You know, I don't want to stand in front of people and talk about my brother that died all the time, but I, I always think that there's every chance that there is one person in this room sitting there, um, absolutely needing to hear something that I have to say, needing to hear this strategy that I have 
needing to hear this reminder that life is worth living, needing to hear how devastating it would be for their family to leave, um, to lose them. And so that is, that is um, one of the reasons that we get um, um, up and do it. But the other day I <clears throat> walked into our office with a team. Um, there's a gentleman in our building that always sort of says, g'day. We'd never really ever stopped and, and spoken to each other. And as I was walking in the door, he was, uh, I was holding the door open for one of our team members and um, I looked up and he was sort of waving me, like sort of calling me out. And I sort of thought that was a bit weird and uh, went out there and said, hey, mate, how are you? I said, I'm Mitch. He said, yeah, I know. And I'm la da 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 And he said, hey, I, um, I, I know who you are. I know what you do. And uh, I just wanted to just pull you aside for a minute and just tell you that um, I've I've been struggling a bit lately. And, you know, my, my wife doesn't really understand and I just didn't really know what to do. And I, I sat with him, stood with him, listened um, asked a few questions, um, didn't really give him much feedback aside from a couple of services that he should reach out to <clears throat> about two weeks later. Um, I saw him and he said, mate, I, um, I didn't go and see any of those services. I didn't, um, I didn't talk to my wife again or anyone else about it. He said, but bloody hell, I felt better just telling you about how I felt. He said, and, and that was just such a really powerful moment for me. And I mean, what a really powerful moment for me. You know, we didn't, I didn't have the answers for him. Um, I didn't fix it for him. I didn't tell him what to go and do exactly, but it, it just in that the, there's so much power in just having a good old fashioned one way conversation where someone has the ability to just shut their mouth and listen. And, and that's all I did. And and I'm not an expert, but that's all I needed to do. And, and did it save his life? I don't know. I'm not going that far to say that, but I know that it helped him crawl out of that little hole that he was in, in that moment. And, um, and, you know, we've had, as I said, people share that about them having their own conversations with others in the name of Speak Up, Say Chatty, which is really powerful. So, um, yeah, there's great learnings in that. You don't have to be an expert. You just listen and you just show that you care. And that's yeah. what I try and do all the time. And, and um, yeah, that's a, a, a really lovely example of, of where it was able to do good, which is something I'm really proud of as well. Yeah, it's awesome. And I think people likely come to you because you can have a lot of empathy for them and their story as well which just i think is an important thing you know if you haven't gone through those those struggles well you know it's sometimes it's hard for people to relate so i think and that, that's the case for a lot of conditions you know going to seminars and talking about things like diabetes if you're not living with say type 1 diabetes yourself yeah talking to someone who's taking daily insulin injections and that kind of thing it's really hard for that for you you know, you can try your hardest, but it's hard for you to empathize with them and understand them if you haven't got that lived experience. So I think yep. it's really, really important message there. Um, tell us a bit about the story about Alex and Bill. That was something that I think was a, a really um, interesting one where yeah. I think it was like seven, yeah. seven years between between points and you're invited to, to one, of, I think it was Alex's wedding. Is that correct? Yeah, no, <clears throat> I'm not me. Sorry, my voice is going me. That's why I'm sipping on tea. I've been doing too much speaking lately. So forgive me for coughing and spluttering all over the place. But geez, I haven't told this story for a while, but um, no, I didn't go to the wedding. I, I did a talk in Launceston here in the North and uh, I was I was on the road and um, I think we had one child at the time and it had been a big week. And, you know, like when I'm on the road and I'm, I miss my family, you know, I, I love um, chats after presentations, like they don't get me wrong. They are a wonderful opportunity for people to share moments of vulnerability for me to give any advice. Listen, it's great. But just on this night, I was like, the, it was a Thursday night footy game on. I was going so pumped. You know, I'd done two talks that day, like just get back, get a steak, get a red, watch the footy. Um, and so I'm packing up quickly, you know, like I'd always give people my time, but on this night, I was just a little bit, just slightly less than normal going to give a hundred percent of myself. But this little bloke came up and uh, oh, this bloke came up and he um, said, have you got a minute? And I'm, of course I do. And he sort of pulled me aside. He shared a story and, and long story short, you can read it on my website, but um, it was basically, he had an apprentice years ago, very, very like 30, 40 years ago. Um, the apprentice worked for him for a while. Uh, and then he left uh, greener pastures, went into the mainland. 10 years later, he came back and rang him and said, I've moved back, Bill. Can I, um, can I come and work with you? And, um, uh, Bill didn't really have the space for him. Like, you know, he had a crew already and he's like, Oh, I don't really have the work, but he was my first apprentice. Yeah. Whatever. Yep. Come back. I'll, I'll put you on and let him work there again for another couple of years. And then Alex worked there for two or three years and then he was off again. Thanks Bill, but I'm off. And Bill was like, right. Oh, no worries. And you know, they were great friends, long time known each other. And, and then about a year after that, Bill got an invite to Alex's wedding and he thought, geez, this is bloody strange. You know, like I'm barely seen him a long time. I'll go to his wedding. He's back here in Tassie. We'll go to his wedding. And he said, I grabbed, uh, grabbed this, his words were, where I grabbed this Sheila and went to this wedding. Don't ask me around that. But he said, I went to this wedding and 
sat there, had a few drinks, and it was lovely, and didn't really speak to them throughout the night at all. But at the end of the night, we were saying goodbye to them all, and Alex's wife came over and said, you're Bill. And I said, yeah, I am. And she said, oh, can I have a, a chat? And she took him outside, and she said, um, hey, I, I, I owe you. I wouldn't be here tonight marrying um, the greatest man alive if it wasn't for you. And he said, what do you mean? She said, well, when Alex um, moved back to Tasmania and asked you for a job the second time, <clears throat> Um, his sister had just passed away to cancer. His wife had left him and he was in a really bad way. Um, he was really suffering with mental health issues. Yeah, he felt that he honestly had no one to turn to. Um, and by you giving him that job, he says to me now that um, you saved his life by giving him that opportunity to come back and have some purpose in his life. And she gave Bill a hug and said, thank you so much for allowing me to marry the man of my dreams. And um, yeah, I just think that he just said, and then the farm at this point, he wasn't a farm, sorry. He just said to me, he said, so there you go. There's a good story. I hope you share it far and wide. And I shook his hand and I left the the um, the room that night. And um, probably one of the greatest stories I've heard, yeah, you know, like just the, the power of never really knowing, you know, Alex didn't tell him that um, he was down and out and he was, life was grim, but Bill found a way to just give him that opportunity. And I just think that that's just a really amazing story that um, his name wasn't Bill. I, I, I can't remember his exact name and I wouldn't share it anyway, but I do. He asked me to share the story and um, bloody hell, I share it far and wide because it's a ripper. Ripper, yeah. And you've had, you know, your Iggy Azalea moments where you've fallen off stage. You've had moments where your <laughs> fly's been undone. Well, yep. It's pretty pertinent. You could probably plan to do that as a bit of, <laughs> yeah. to tie in this in some extent um, yeah lucky I, lucky i had undies on um uh, but yeah no there's uh i think we we had our gala ball recently and i shared um probably the the worst one ever was um ja, a former team member of ours he ran our sports program and he was um he was doing a prez and he used to always look for the example of a, a, an athlete in the room injured so that he could say pin them out you know an arm in a sling like hey what happened to you oh, i broke my arm how'd you do that playing footy right how do people treat you with a broken arm, oh, they hold doors for me. They look out for me. And then you go into the example of mental health, you know, like, well, when you've yeah. got a poor mental health, people don't really notice and hold doors, et cetera. And anyway, he picked out this kid and he said, you, you've, you know, how'd you get that black eye? And everyone sort of started laughing in the room and, and James was like, oh, oh, I just said his name. Then I have to get you to blur that out. He said, oh, um, uh, what's going on? And they said, that's, that's uh, not a black eye. That's a birthmark. And uh, you can only imagine the, the mare that he had. That is a far worse um, uh, worse mare than what I had with my fly undone, but um, that that kid took it in good spirit. He came up and he and our team member had a bit of a laugh about it. But yeah, we've put our foot in it at times. Um, but that's all. Yeah, we celebrate that as a team. You know, living and breathing mental health and suicide is is tricky and difficult. But you got to have some fun along the way, and um, we've certainly done that. That's for sure. Yeah, well, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today, Mitch. Um, give us a bit of a, a rundown with the Get Frank podcast. So I know if people are listening to this podcast and they want to. Tune into your your podcast. You can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Um, tell us a little bit about what it's what it entails. Yeah, it's um, it's actually it's um, it's called Get Frank, and uh, I always think that I um, am where I am and do what I do because people um gave me a voice and and listened to me and my story, and um, so I sort of wanted to do that as well. And um, it's you know over the years I've done a lot of been doing a lot of radio interviews and sort of grew a real passion for being on a microphone and doing this sort of stuff. And um, yeah, set up, get Frank of 50 episodes at the moment on a little bit of a break at the moment. You know, I've, again, I've I identified that life has a lot on and have gone on a bit of a break with that, but um, yeah, 50 episodes with some wonderful stories, sad, um, uh, uplifting, empowering, um, just people's life journeys of tragedy, of, of bouncing back of weight loss of uh, yeah, a huge range of stuff. Um, um it's been awesome. Yeah. I've, I've absolutely loved every second of it. It's been great. It's brought, uh, it's helped help too. You know, I've, I've had people come on and share their story and then afterwards have gone on to, um, you know, do some more media stuff and get some more traction with it is the, the charity or the initiative that they've been wanting to set up and do a lot more of. So that's been really awesome. But, um, I also on Mondays have get a little Frank, which is where I have a couple of people and we just for half an hour talk about, the local news, have a bit of a laugh, um, you know, take the piss out of each other a little bit. And that's a lot of fun as well. So yeah, that's been, um, yeah, been a lot of fun. And as I said, just uh, good to deviate out of the, take my mental health hat off and, and have a bit of fun and be Mitch McPherson and talk about some other stuff. It's really cool. Awesome, buddy. And um, what we do with our guests on the podcast now, I've got a little bit of a an interactive uh, playlist on Spotify. So I'll get my guests just to give us their... Oh. 
favorite banger might be something that you've been listening to lately or one of your favorite tunes but if you had to add one one song to the the normless playlist what would it be look i um my music taste i cop it a lot right <laughs> so uh i've uh always just copped it i'm a big i just remember growing up dad dancing around dad loved prince george michael and i just got the rule like dance beat hip-hop michael jackson um so i love my r&b hip-hop i love chris brown justin timberlake usher michael jackson um so if i'm going to give you a song oh geez i get in trouble because michael jackson and chris brown have both got you know um shady histories and so when i represent them and give them a song but let's go um you rock my world but my by michael jackson that's a absolute banger uh it was big part of his comeback for a while and uh yeah um obviously miss him but he left some uh timeless music for us all to enjoy for the rest of our lives yeah i, th I think we can separate the person from the the music yeah. i think you know correct everyone yep. appreciates good music so bloody eyes absolutely all right mate what's next for for mitch what's on the horizon um for me yeah i'm i'm still very much invested in this you know as i said 10 years next august so um 10 years doing anything you sort of you know, I, I certainly haven't lost the passion i've you know, there's certainly some areas of, um, you know, stay chatty work where you're like, oh, you know, I've been in there. I've, I've, I've done that a lot, you know, and I, I'm sort of outgrowing, not outgrowing that, but my desire to, to, to be part of certain elements of it is certainly fading a little bit, but I'm very much invested in this organization going from strength to strength and, and we'll remain doing that for hopefully forever. Um, but yeah, outside of that, I'm, I'm emceeing a lot of things now. I'm, um, emceeing dinners and, um, um, you know, fundraisers and footy events and best and fairest and stuff. And as I mentioned a minute ago, I applied and, and got the role as game day MC for the Jack jumpers here at um, my state bank arena. So running around there as the hype man, getting the crowd up and about it at those games. And, um, yeah, I'm just loving that side of it. It just, as I said, allows me to, um, do different things and, and have a bit of fun with, with life. Not that I don't have fun in my stay chatty stuff, but allows me to not necessarily just be branded as that stay chatty guy that lost his brother. You know, I, um, that's always really important to me and I'm, I'm proud to be known as that, but at times it's nice to not. Um, so that's been really enjoyable for me and having a lot of fun and, and hope that that sort of area of my, um, that sort of media style, um, works as well. Um, also hosting a, a sports radio show on Saturday mornings as well called the water boys. So, yeah, it's that sort of stuff's really fun and and having a lot of joy with it, which is good. Awesome, mate. We'll we'll put all your social media channel <clears throat> and link to where people can purchase the book behind the smile. Awesome. Um, in the in the show notes, if anyone's interested in in following up and seeing a little bit more about what you do, but I just want to say a big thank you for sharing your story. I know it as much as you love what you do. It I can tell it is it still doesn't get any easier and every time it makes you quite emotional. Um, but hopefully, as you say, hopefully it's helped someone out there to, you know, speak up or take control of their, their mental health if they're struggling. Yeah, uh, absolutely, mate. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> I certainly hope I don't get to a day where, unless my voice completely fails me and stops me doing it, but I will continue to do it. And look, I um, anyone listening today, you know, I, I know that listening to this won't necessarily take away all your problems and fix everything or fix any issues going on for those in your life that you really care about that are struggling. But what I'm confident of uh, that a lived experience story does is make you stand up and take note. And, um, and I hope that um, people today, you know, turn this off at the end and, and walk away and go, you know what, there are just some small things I can do every day to make a difference. And um, you know, and I, and I really believe that if anyone ever says that they went through a whole day and didn't notice anyone slightly off their game and going through a tough time. You know, I call bullshit on that. I believe that yeah. there's so many challenges going on in life and we have the opportunity every day to make someone feel better. Um, so get off your ass and do it. Um, but also, you know, keep an eye on yourself as well. You know, don't be low for too long. Be low. That's okay. You don't panic. Don't be, don't be worried about it. But if you're low for too long, it stops you doing things you enjoy and gets in the way of your life. Get out there and tell someone and share it. Um, get, get, get back on the horse, get better. Tomorrow's a new day. Stay chatty. Stay chatty, yeah. yeah. All right, you're a champion, mate. Thanks for your time. I'll um, We'll wrap things up here. I hope you have a fantastic day and a pleasure having a chat with you. Mate, morning. thanks to you and thanks for all your amazing episodes. And thank you for giving me a, a different platform to, to share my story, mate. It's been a pleasure.